Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Babanjana Kundo from uh, UBC, and she's going to speak about uh, arithmetic statistics and Iwasawa theory. Thank you, Payman, for the introduction, and thank you, everybody, who is able to make it to the seminar today. Um, right, if you can turn on your videos, I would really appreciate that, because it's always nice to see uh, faces. If, if you can't, it's totally fine. Okay, so... Uh, as my title suggests, it's Ivasava Theory and Arithmetic Statistics. And uh, what I will be talking about today is um, questions that we can answer, which are at the intersection of both of these subjects. So I will start by talking about Ivasava Theory because, um, of course, everybody in the audience is probably not an expert on this subject. So what is Ivasava Theory? So in Ivasava Theory, we normally study Galva modules like class groups and Selmer groups, and we study them in infinite towers of number fields. So you want to study the class group of a number field or the Selmer group associated to an elliptic curve over a number field, but answering such questions are kind of hard. And Ivasava, and then later on a lot of other mathematicians who built on this subject, so Ivasava in particular for class groups, had this brilliant insight, which might appear a little counterintuitive at first, that answering questions like uh, about you know class group of a number field is hard, but if you can put it in a nice tower, and I'll talk about what's nice in a minute, then the properties will stabilize and you can uh, gather information that you were interested in. So what sort of towers are we talking about? We are talking about ZP extensions of number fields. So in particular, let's start with our favorite number field Q. Um, on top of that, you have a degree P extension Q1. What is Q1? Q1 over Q is a cyclic degree P extension such that it is the unique real degree P subfield sitting, uh, sitting inside Q theta P squared. Similarly, you construct Q2 over Q1, which is sitting inside Q theta P cubed and so on. So Qn is this degree uh, p to the n cyclic extension over Q sitting inside Q zeta p to the n plus one. And you take the limit, you get what we call Q cyclotomic. And using infinite Galva theory, you can say that this Galva group, which I'll be denoting by gamma for the rest of today's talk, is isomorphic to the, uh, is isomorphic to Zp, the p-adic integers. And of course, I did this construction over Q, but this construction is very general and you can do it for any number field F. For Q, the cyclic, uh, sorry, the cyclotomic ZP extension is the unique ZP extension that you can construct. But depending on the number field, uh, it is possible that there are infinitely many ZP extensions over the number field. So in particular, something that we will come to maybe at the end of today's talk are anticyclotomic ZP extensions. These are supported by imaginary quadratic fields and other CM fields, but I'll just take the case of imaginary quadratic fields. So that K be an imaginary quadratic field. So it's a degree two extension over Q. Of course, like I said before, you will have the cyclotomic ZP extension over K. The cyclotomic ZP extension over K the cyclotomic ZP extension, K cyclotomic, is in fact not just Galva over K, it's Galva over Q, and it's cyclic, uh, sorry, it's abelian over Q. So you have the cyclotomic ZP extension, which is Galva over Q, and this Galva group is abelian. But what you can also do is you can construct this other ZP extension that we call the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension. And 
Here again, the nth layer is a cyclic p to the n uh, degree extension over k. But over here, you have this interesting property that this kn over q is again galva, but it is not abelian, it is dihedral. Uh, kn over q is non abelian, in fact, dihedral of order uh, 2p to the n. And then you can take the limit of that and you get what's called the anticyclotomic ZP extension over the imaginary quadratic field. So a technical object that I will have to introduce at this point is called the Iwasawa algebra. And you can define an Iwasawa algebra for any pro P group. Uh, for most of today's talk, I will only be interested in the in gamma that I talked about earlier. That's the cyclotomic uh, Galva group. It's isomorphic to ZP, or um, I'll also be talking about the anticyclotomic to, towards the end. So G will be gamma for most of our talk, which will be isomorphic to ZP. But this is true for any pro P group. So the Iwasawa algebra is denoted by lambda G, and it is, um, you can think of it as the variation of the group ring of G with piatic coefficients. But there's this uh, very famous result of Zer, which says that, let's take the case of gamma isomorphic to ZP, then this Iwasawa algebra is isomorphic to a formal power series ring in one variable. So it's, ZP double bracket T. And this will be extremely important for us. What one can do is, uh, so maybe before I say that, I should point out that uh, this is not a PID. You have maximal ideals, um, which are generated by two elements. And uh, in particular, P and T. So it's not principal, but it has a structure theorem, which is very similar to the structure theorem that you might be familiar with for uh, modules over a PID. So the structure theorem for finitely generated torsion lambda gamma module says the following that for such a module M, you have a pseudo isomorphism. I'll tell you in a second what pseudoisomorphism is. It, you have a pseudoisomorphism, which, um, and uh, it's pseudoisomorphic to lambda mod p to the mi. You have certain copies of those plus lambda mod fj's to the nj's, where fj's are irreducible polynomials. They are a certain kind of irreducible polynomials, but Maybe that's not too important for today's talk. And what do I mean by this twiddle over here? As I said, it's pseudoisomorphism, which means that I have a homomorphism with a finite kernel and a finite co-kernel. Okay, and the anhylator of this module M, which we'll call the characteristic polynomial, is p to the power of summation of these mi's times product of fj's to the nj's. And associated to this module, you can have these two invariants, which will be extremely important, which will be our object of study, which will be the mu invariant, which is the summation of all the mi's that were appearing over here, and lambda invariant, which is the summation of nj times the degree of fj. So fj is where polynomials with CP coefficients. So one extremely um, fascinating um, use of the structure theorem, at least for me, is um, this classical result of Evasava from the 1950s, which kind of kick-started this whole field. So he said, let F be any number field and F infinity over F be any ZP extension. So he's really, this theorem is for any ZP extension. And 
so for any ZP extension, you have these finite layers, which are which we are calling Fn. And he wanted to study the class numbers of these um, intermediate layers. And he says, let En be the largest power of P that is dividing um, the class number. And he gives this precise formula for N sufficiently large. He says En is mu P to the power N plus lambda N plus nu where mu lambda and nu are constants, in fact, integers independent of n, mu and lambda are non-negative integers and nu is um, any integer. So he's giving us a precise formula for how the p part of the class group can grow in uh, towers of number fields and the mu and the lambda that show up are precisely the mu and the lambda that are coming from the structure theorem, here the module M is the one that you will associate to a Propy Hilbert class field over a CP extension. Um, but this is a result from the 1950s, which essentially kickstarted the field. Um, so in 1972, Mazur got interested in this theory and he asked, a question which is how does the rank of an elliptic curve grow in towers of number fields, in particular in ZP extensions? And the short answer is we don't know. But of course, um, in, the, in these many years, there has been some progress that has been made in answering this question. And there are some partial answers that, that we can say. But, this theory is inspired by what Ibasawa was doing for class, class numbers and class groups in ZP extensions. So um, for a large part of this discussion, I will assume that P is a prime of ordinary, good ordinary reduction. It's a technical assumption that I really have to make at this point. If um, you're not familiar with what it means, it, it shouldn't really matter. So I'm not going to get into the details of that, and p will always be an uh, will always be an odd prime, so p will not be equal to two. So, for simplicity, I will assume that either f is an abelian extension over q, or f is equal to q. Um, a lot of this theory is true in general, but the reason for me to make this assumption is because when you have this assumption, you have a deep result of Cato from 2004, which tells you that the pre-primary Selmer group that I'll describe in a second is a torsion lambda gamma module. So it being finitely generated is always going to be true irrespective of the number field that you work with. I, I think I should make a correction here in my notes. It's the really atomic, uh, but torsion, which is an important property for us uh, that we will have to use um, is only known for elliptic curves defined over Q base change to an abelian extension. Okay, so how do I, so if you think about Selmer groups every day, that's, that's great. If you don't, the only thing that is probably important for you to know to understand what's going on is that uh, Selmer groups are, these objects that you can associate with an elliptic curve that is going to measure some sort of global, local global failure. So many of you might be aware, otherwise let me just write down the um, for, um, equation for an elliptic curve. So let's say I'm writing my elliptic curve for simplicity as this, there's obviously a more general way of writing this, but for me today, elliptic curves will be y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b with integer coefficients, let's say. Um, what are we interested in primarily? Of course, there's a discriminant condition uh, to make sure that the curve is non-singular, but uh, yeah. So we are interested in finding rational solutions um, for this equation. So rational numbers X and Y such that this equation is true. And of course, we're looking for non-trivial solutions. Now, the, 
if you look at this equation mod p, it is possible that there are elliptic curves such that mod p, there are non-trivial solutions for every prime p, but globally, there are no solutions. And that information is somehow captured by the Selmer group. I will only be interested in the P primary part of the Selmer group. So I'll be writing that as cell P infinity E over F. Um, so F was my base field. Um, so you have a short exact sequence that comes essentially from Comer theory. And this will be kind of important for us today. So you have E bracket F. So these are the F rational points over E. Um, tensored with QP mod ZP. And on the right, you have the tetschoff ravich group and the P primary part of that. Wherever uh, we need to assume finiteness of Shaw, we will. It's, it's a conjecture that this group should always be finite. Um, we are kind of, we're, we're pretty far from proving that conjecture, but it's um, well accepted or yeah, I, I will be assuming finiteness of Shaw wherever it's required. So we have this short exact sequence over any number field. And in fact, you can take direct limits and then you can get such an equation, uh, such a short exact sequence even over the cyclotomic ZP expansion. Now, the model weight theorem, of course, tells us that over a number field, the rank the F, this is, EF is finitely generated. So this is going to be some number which is finite. Over F cyclotomic, it's obviously not immediate, but it is a deep result uh, that goes back to both Caro and Rorlich, which tells us that even over F cyclotomic, um, the, the, yeah, the, it is finitely generated. So what that tells us is that this is going to be um, some copies of QP mod ZP. Over F cyclotomic, this need not be finite and that's okay. But what I want to say here is that it's possible even for F equals Q. So, so okay, maybe before I say that. So I've sort of, emphasized over here that the P infinity Selmer group can be thought of as coming from these two pieces. Um, one's the Sha and one's the uh, rational points. And you really, if you want to get information on the rank of the elliptic curve, the only tools that we kind of have at the moment is to understand the Selmer group. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, we're, we don't really know how to study ranks of elliptic curves uh, using any other method, but I might be wrong, um, but that's, that's how much I know. So, so when we want to answer this question that Mazur asked, we realize that you would have to understand the Selmer group and you would have to understand the Selmer group in these towers. So, here is where the work of Kato kind of becomes important because now we know that um, the Selmer group or the dual of the Selmer group, uh, but that's something that we have to do for technical reasons. Let's talk about this, just the Selmer group itself is a finitely generated torsion lambda gamma module. So what that means is that you can invoke the structure theorem and you can define a mu invariant and a lambda invariant associated uh, to, to your Selmer group um, over the cyclotomic ZP extension. And what Mieser could show was that there were several examples of elliptic curves, which were defined over Q, where P was a prime of good ordinary reduction, P was an odd prime, but the mu invariant was positive. So that is already uh, very different from what at least is expected to happen in the case of um, 
class groups. Maybe I didn't mention that, but maybe I should at this point. So there's a conjecture of Ivasava that mu over the cyclotomic extension. So this is the mu associated to the class group. So mu over the cyclotomic CP extension should always be equal to zero. And this is known in some cases, in particular when F over Q is abelian, then this is known. And this is a result of Ferrero and Washington. from 1979. So it's a pretty old result and not much progress has been made in this direction. But what I want to highlight over here is that even for elliptic curves over Q, it's possible that mu is positive. So there is some deviation from uh, what's happening in, uh, in, in the class group story. There's a conjecture of Greenberg. Um, which I would want to mention here, it says that if your elliptic curve is defined over Q and your mod P representation is irreducible, then the mu invariant for the elliptic curve or for the Selmer group associated to the elliptic curve should always be equal to zero. And again, this seems to be a conjecture about which not much is known. Um, okay. A question about yeah. sorry, a question about mu equals zero for class groups. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if there's is there like a philosophical reason why one might expect that mu should be zero for class groups, or is this just something that people observe by looking at data? Huh. So I am. Um, not a hundred percent sure of how much data Evasava looked at uh, because I I just don't recall it from his paper at the moment on the spot. But I know that when he made this conjecture the first time, he sort of said it as a question, and he said mu should be zero for all ZP extensions. But later he's found that at least with the anticyclotomic ZP extensions or some variation of the anticyclotomic ZP extensions, mu can be arbitrarily large. And then he rephrased his conjecture to put it this way. So I'm going to hold up on saying anything about how much data he looked at, but um, anything that we have done, any data that has been collected um, after that, like, I, I don't know about what Ivasava did, but everything seems to point towards mu equals zero. Okay, thanks. So a fact that we have when mu is equal to zero, so this is, I'm going to for a moment assume from here on that, let's say mu is equal to zero. Then you know that the lambda invariant that you can associate to the Selmer group is the ZP core rank of the, um, I should write this more carefully, of the P primary Selmer group of E over F cyclotomic. Now, if you go back to, so you should really think of this as a fact, I don't want to get into the details, but seeing this inequality should not be too hard from the short exact sequence that we wrote down here. So uh, because I said it's a fact, a non-trivial one that EF cyclotomic is finitely generated. So, and this is injecting into the P primary Selmer group. So this inequality makes sense. And of course the rank can only increase in an extension. So this inequality is therefore kind of straightforward. So this sort of tells you that the lambda invariant of the elliptic curve, at least when you know that mu is equal to zero, is always bigger than or equal to the rank of the elliptic curve over the base field. Now, uh, just a quick remark is that I did not want to make at least the introduction of this talk very technical. So I did not in particular want to invoke things like Mazur's control theorem, et cetera, 
But if you're familiar with those ideas, then uh, you can prove this sort of an inequality um, using slightly more uh, technical and um, involved results. But what that allows you to do is get rid of the requirement that f over q is abelian. So in nutshell, lambda, if you know that mu is equal to zero, then lambda is bigger than equal to the rank of the elliptic curve over the base field um, uh, holds true for uh, every number field. Okay, so at this point, um, so this is, uh, I'm just, I was just recapping the results that have been known so far. And no, understanding mu equals zero is a very difficult question, whether it be for class groups, whether it be for elliptic curves. Uh, a lot of the times we see mu is equal to zero. Um, there obviously have not been any counterexamples to Greenberg's conjecture, but finding conditions as to when mu is equal to zero is hard. So this is a very difficult question. And therefore, uh, this was something that Anvir Shre and I wanted to start exploring was, well, okay, we cannot always answer, we, we do not know precisely when mu is equal to zero, but can we answer such questions on average? Can we say that, well, okay, a certain percentage of times, or at least a certain percentage of times, we know that mu is equal to zero and lambda is equal to the rank of the elliptic curve. Uh, yeah, lambda is equal to the rank of the elliptic curve over the base. So when is this inequality and equality? And so this was something that Anvish and I, I uh, started studying last year. And then we wrote a few papers and then there's collaborations with other people. So um, I just want to mention these names before I forget. And in case I kind of forget telling which results are by whom. So uh, everything that I will be talking about after this will be in collaboration with different people, but the Jeff Free Hatley from Union College, Antonio Le from Laval, and Vishre, who is currently at UBC, and Florian Sprung, who is at Arizona State. So, okay, so what are the questions that we are interested in understanding or that we think are tractable at this point? Maybe before that, any questions uh, before I actually start going into our um, results. And this might be a good time for me to pause for questions. Okay. So if there are no questions, I will continue. So over Q cyclotomic or maybe over F cyclotomic, the sort of questions that one can ask are, let's say we fix an elliptic curve over the base field and we vary our prime P, what can you say about mu equals zero and lambda equal to the rank on average? Or you could fix the prime P and you could vary the elliptic curve and then ask the same question. Um, so this was actually the first result that Enrich and I worked on. Uh, we worked it out for f equals q. And um, this question was possible to talk about both in the p equals ordinary and p equals super singular case. So I'll maybe briefly talk about what it means to be super singular and how the theory is slightly different there. But before I say that, maybe I should also say that when you're in the fixed elliptic curve varying prime, um, the, the key insight actually, actually the key insight for this whole thing that, that we started studying comes from a result of Greenberg where he studied this question. So he fixed an elliptic curve and he was varying the prime P for rank zero elliptic curves. And um, I, I will describe what uh, his proof was but uh, that's, that's where the, 
inspiration to study such questions came from. And to very briefly mention the sort of issues that come up with the super singular case is the following. Let's say E over Q is an elliptic curve. Uh, P is a prime of good super singular reduction. Then we in fact know that the Selmer group, well, it's going to be finitely generated, but it's not going to be torsion. So, so this result of Kato is really very crucially using the ordinary hypothesis. So it's not torsion over the um, cyclotomic ZP extension. And therefore, a lot of this theory really just breaks down. Uh, so in 2003, Kobayashi uh, defined two subgroups of the P primary Selmer group over Q cyclotomic. Those are called the plus and the minus Selmer groups. He showed that those subgroups are in fact lambda torsion. So you can apply the structure theorem to those subgroups. You can study what's called the mu plus and the mu minus and the lambda plus and the lambda minus. Those are defined in analog space. And uh, again, for lambda plus and lambda minus, you have this, inequal uh, yeah, this inequality that lambda, so if P is a prime of super singular reduction, then lambda plus or lambda minus, this is bigger than or equal to the rank of the elliptic curve over F. And then you can basically, instead of asking this question, you can say when are mu plus and minus equal to zero or when are lambda plus and minus equal to the rank of the elliptic curve. So the question changes slightly, but you can still uh, put forth a question that is very precise and it's possible to answer this as I will explain later on. Then um, in joint work with Anvish and Chef, we sort of wanted to go a step further and we said, okay, what happens if we a base change to imaginary quadratic fields? So our elliptic curve is still defined over Q and, but we're looking at the base change to an imaginary quadratic field K. And now we are no longer looking at the cyclotomic ZP extension, but instead we want to look at what's happening in the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension. Now the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension. So with Jeff, maybe I should point out that we were only working in the P ordinary case. So the, the story in the super singular case would be very different, or at least that's what we thought at the beginning. Um, so in the ordinary case, uh, you can again, um, divide this into like two primary cases. So one is called the definite, the other is called the indefinite. Definite uh, is, okay, maybe I should talk about indefinite first. So indefinite is when something like the Hegner hypothesis holds. So what that means is that, so over the anticyclotomic ZP extension, you have this interesting property that not all the prime numbers are going to be finitely decomposed. So there are some primes uh, in K, there are actually uh, infinitely many primes of uh, density one half, but whatever. There are primes in K such that when you go up the anticyclotomic tower, they're gonna to split completely in the anticyclotomic tower. And that tends to cause some issues. Um, so Bertolini uh, said, showed that if you are in this Hegner hypothesis case, which means that your elliptic curve is defined over Q and you're base changing it to K, let's say, now your elliptic curve, let's say has conductor N, And there are, of course, primes that divide n. If you're writing n as n plus and n minus, that means 
the primes when you look at what's happening in k n plus is i think when they the primes dividing n which split completely and n minus are the ones which don't split completely so they remain inert then the Hegner hypothesis says that there are no primes dividing n that remain inert in k so there is like this no n minus sort of a component. And in that case, you actually have that your Selmer group is again, no longer torsion. So again, this whole theory breaks down. On the other hand, in the definite case, you it's, it's much more similar to the cyclotomic case. There you want that there are odd many prime numbers dividing n which remain inert in N minus, uh, sorry, which remain inert in your imaginary quadratic field K. And in that case, um, life is a little easier. Uh, so yeah, so when you're studying this anticyclotomic theory, you have to sort of, even for ordinary, you have to divide this into two separate cases and see what's happening. But the questions remain the same. You can either fix E and your imaginary quadratic field vary your prime P, or you can fix your prime P and your number field K, vary the elliptic curve, or you can do this third thing where you fix the elliptic curve and the prime and vary um, the imaginary quadratic field. So that's in some sense looking at quadratic twists. And again, um, you can answer questions about mu equals zero uh, and lambda equal to the rank in those cases. The super singular theory over the anticyclotomic tower, as you can imagine, is going to have two difficulties. Firstly, it's super singular. Secondly, it's anticyclotomic. So this is something that is almost written up. This is trying to work with Florin Sprung and um, this again over here, you have to look at the plus minus Selmer groups. But um, the, the theory is similar, but still significantly different because you have, to, you have to be very careful with what sort of conditions you have to impose, etc. Then the other thing that you can probably do if you're interested is vary the ZP extensions themselves, see what's happening. And once you have answered questions about ZP extensions, as Ivasava theorists, you might want to venture into the land of non-commutative Ivasava theory and say, how is the rank of the elliptic curve um, growing in um, a non at, at each layer of a non-commutative uh, P at P extension? And this is uh, recently accepted work uh, with uh, Antonio Lay and Andrish. So these are the four types of questions that we have considered or are currently considering. And as I mentioned, the key insight into this whole thing really comes from, uh, I think Greenberg even called it a proposition. Uh, I don't think he called it a theorem, but it really comes from uh, a result of Greenberg. So he was studying rank zero elliptic curves um, over Q, and he wanted to vary all the primes. And he said that for um, density one primes of good ordinary reduction, mu is always equal to zero. Uh, as, in fact, he actually said that the Selmer group is trivial over the cyclotomic CP extension. But what is the uh, so how did he prove his theorem? So he said, look at, so I mentioned that there's this characteristic polynomial, right? There's this characteristic polynomial. So he says, you can write it out. And he's like, look at the leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial. And it is known that this leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial uh, looks like this. 
So what are the terms on the right hand side? So th this is up to a periodic unit. So you have the size of Sha over Q, the P primary part of that. Then you have the P part of the Tamagawa numbers at primes of bad reduction of E. This is basically measuring the anomalous primes. So you're looking at E, looking at um, the mod P reduction at the FP, the FP points of that and the P primary torsion square that. And at, at the bottom, you have the um, torsion points, the P torsion points are over Q. And it's not too hard to convince yourself that if the leading coefficient is a unit, then the Selmer group is going to be finite over the cyclotomic EP extension. That's really just coming from the structure theorem. And then there is another result of Greenberg, which is, uh, very strong, which actually says that if your Selmer group is finite over the cyclotomic extension, then in fact, it has to be trivial over the cyclotomic extension. So his idea was how often is the, how often is the leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial a piadic unit? And as you can understand, if you look at the right-hand side of this equation, then it's going to be a piadic unit. Well, at least if you can make sure that each of the terms are piadic units. So, well, if you assume finiteness of Sha, then let me change colors maybe. So, so for him, E is fixed. So he's just going to vary over all primes P. So this object is going to be divisible by P for only finitely many primes P. The Result of Maser, Maser's torsion theorem also tells us that there are only finitely many primes P that can um, give you a non trivial um, denominator. Then you have the Tamagawa numbers. Now, the Tamagawa number is non trivial only when your prime is a prime of bad reduction. And even then, you have uh, very few choices of what it can be. So there are only, the Tamagawa number in particular is going to be finite. So again, they're going to be only at most finitely many primes that can divide this quantity. And regarding the anomalous primes, one can show using, at least over Q, you can just do this using a uh, clever Chebotarev density argument, which is not very difficult, that this object can be non-trivial uh, for density one primes. Um, sorry, so this is going to, my bad. This is going to be non-trivial for density zero primes. So what that tells you is that the leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial is going to be a piadic unit for um, density one primes. And that implies density one good ordinary primes. And that using this argument tells you that the Selmer group is going to be trivial over the cyclotomic CP extension in all those cases. Over F, the whole story is very similar except that counting these anomalous primes gets a little difficult. And when I was working on my thesis, Kumar Murdy very kindly pointed out to me that he had a result which counted that. So using Kumar's result, you can actually even not just over Q, but over any number field F, you can, you can get the same result that Greenberg did. And because he's telling you how to count this, um, again, using a very clever Chepitharev density argument, but that, um, yeah, so, so you have this result for Q, for F. Of course, these are just rank zero curves. What do you do in a higher rank case? So in the higher rank case, um, things get a little difficult. So what we realized, well, it's kind of an old observation, but we sort of 
um, had to use this is that this leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial is actually equal to uh, what's called the Euler characteristic. Now, I'm going to just recall the definition of the Euler characteristic. It is um, an alternating product um, because gamma is, has peak homological dimension one. So you don't etch to one where it's everything is trivial. So you only have to look at the size of H zero quotiented by the size of the H one. And if you're working with the rank zero elliptic curve, both these groups are finite. So the Euler characteristic makes sense. And what you really get is therefore that the Euler characteristic um, of the Selmer group is up to a piadic unit equal to whatever I've written down on the right-hand side. But when you go to the rank one case, this Euler characteristic is no longer well-defined because your numerator and denominator are no longer finite. So you have to introduce what's called the truncated Euler characteristic. And in, it, it, it's a non-trivial definition, but uh, what you can show is that this definition, of course, makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's a useful object. It's the kernel. So from H0 to H1, you have a map. The kernel um, is actually finite and the co-kernel is, is also finite, and you look at that quotient. So that's the truncated Euler characteristic. And that's the object that is related to the leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial uh, when you are in a higher rank case. This was something that was shown by Sarah Zervis in um, the late 2000s. And again, you can sort of conclude doing a similar kind of an argument, of course, it's not exactly the same argument, but a similar kind of an argument looking at the structure theorem that the truncated Euler characteristic being a unit is equivalent to mu equals zero and lambda being equal to the rank of the elliptic curve. And now you want to, of course, because we were interested in the right hand side we wanted to know how often is mu equal zero and lambda equal to the rank so we are interested basically in understanding how often is the order characteristic a unit and once again you have the formula which is very similar to what i showed you above except that now there is this uh, normalized periodic regulator um, so this periodic regulator, I think uh, this, this periodic regulator, it's periodic regulator divided by P to the rank of the elliptic curve. So the, this object appears to be very, very difficult to understand at the moment. We don't have a lot of information about it, but uh, at least there's not a lot of theoretical information about it. Um, you have a lot of computational data that has been um, calculated, so going back to the work of Coates and McDonnell in the 90s, then Chris, Chris Woodridge in the early 2000s, and then we did some computational data as well. And what it really looks like is that this object is, is a piadic unit almost all the time, but of course we can't, uh, we can't prove it, but the reason why I mentioned this is that basically this sort of suggests that uh, we can push forward Greenberg's idea where you're fixing an elliptic curve, uh, fixing your number field Q uh, and varying over primes to uh, not just, you don't have to only look at rank zero curves, but you can uh, push that to um, higher rank curves as well. So this finishes the first story where uh, we were fixing an elliptic curve and varying p. What might be a little more interesting from the point of view of arithmetic statistics is when you are fixing the prime and varying the elliptic curve. So here, um, I'm just going to focus on the rank zero case, um, but you want to arrange the heights in a meaningful way. 
And the way we do that is we arrange them by height. So that's, that seems to be a standard thing to do in arithmetic statistics. And to understand when is mu equal to zero and lambda equal to zero, because we're in the rank zero case, we want to understand when uh, we want to get an upper bound on when P divides the Euler characteristic. Here, we can just work with the Euler characteristic because uh, we're in the rank zero case. We don't have to work with the truncated object. So what are the objects that we want to understand? We want to understand either P divides Sha or P divides the Tamagawa number or P is an anomalous prime, excuse me. The reason why the quotient really, uh, the denominator isn't all that important is because it's a, it's a fact that the Euler characteristic is always going to be an integer. So it's fine for us to just look at what's happening in the numerator. Now, how do you study Sha? So you want to study for a fixed prime P, how often is, uh, so for what proportion of elliptic curves is P dividing Sha? So for that, we actually uh, looked at a result of Delaunay where he worked this out. So he has heuristics which say that it's given by, so it's given by this, what looks like a pretty ugly quantity. Um, and as P becomes large, you can show that this actually goes to zero. So he's telling us that for a large P, the proportion of elliptic curves, the proportion of rank zero elliptic curves, such that P divides the hf ravich group is becoming small. Um, and, and it's, yeah, it's becoming small actually very fast. Then you want to study the Tamagawa numbers. Um, so that's this part. Now, what does it mean for the Tamagawa number to be divisible by P? So for simplicity, let us say that we are fixing a prime P to be bigger than or equal to five, uh, because two and three uh, things can be a little different and um, that's, we want to avoid that for now. So P divides the Tamagawa number precisely when the Kodaira type is of the form one P n for some n bigger than or equal to one. And this, so now we basically want to know how often, so for a fixed prime P for what proportion of elliptic curves is the Kodaira type one P n. And for that, we can actually use a recent, quite recent result of Cremona and Sadek. Uh, at least the preprint was put out in 2020. I think it's now published or at least accepted for publication. Uh, but they tell us how to count those. And you can do a little bit of uh, calculations to show that the proportion of rank zero elliptic curves such that the Kodaira type is of the form 1pn is going to be strictly less than zero p minus one. And as p becomes large, zero p approaches one from the right. So this quantity also goes to zero as p becomes large. And now we finally want to handle the case of anomalous primes, sorry. So we want to say, well, let's fix a prime P. So for what proportion of elliptic curves is um, P an anomalous prime as we are varying over all rank zero elliptic curves arranged by height. And so initially it was, we, we got some bound which was not very good. And then we uh, actually, we had to, just provide some computational data because we did not know how to handle it very well. And then when we were working on our other projects, future projects, we realized that uh, a lot of this had actually been done. Um, so one can combine results of Shoof and Lenstra or go back to certain results of Waterhouse. And from there you can show that 
counting of these anomalous primes is related to what at least Shroof calls counting Kronecker class number formula. And for that, Lenstra gives a precise estimate, which I've written down over here. So C is some explicit constant that you can compute. And again, as P goes to infinity, you can see that this quantity goes towards zero. So um, what this really is telling us at this point is that if you're arranging your Rang's elliptic curves by height, then the proportion of elliptic curves for which uh, either mu is not equal to zero or the lambda is strictly greater than zero, or in other words, P divides the um, Euler characteristic, um, you can write it down, but uh, I, I'm, I did not write down the explicit formula, but it's basically going towards zero as P goes to infinity. Now, the, the idea, so over here we were using the, this formula for the leading coefficient of the characteristic polynomial. And this formula is somehow very specific to the cyclotomic ZP extension. When you're working with the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension, the formula remains somewhat similar, but there is one key difference. So in the anti-cyclotomic case, uh, let's use this, instead of taking the product over all primes of bad reduction where um, a bad reduction of E, you have to only take into account those primes of bad reduction, which when base change to K um, are split in K. In particular, you only need to care about those which are not going to split completely in your anti-cyclotomic CP extension. And then, of course, you need to be very careful with how you can at least ensure um, torsionness, et cetera, in the anti-cyclotomic case. But once you have done that, you again use this Euler characteristic sort of an approach. In the super singular case, um, the Euler characteristic formula looks quite different. And um, that one can, so that's actually been worked out by BD Kim, which, which one can use. And in the non-commutative setting, the, the story is of course a lot more complicated, but there is a way to talk about Euler characteristic again in that setting by using results of um, Sarah Zerbis. So you can, there are these results which allow you to compare, which give you an explicit formula of how the Euler characteristic um, of the cyclotomic ZP extension compares to that of a non-commutative P-adic Lee extension. And using that formula, you can um, sort of play the same game. I think this would be a good place for me to stop and I would be very happy to take any questions that you have at this point. And thank you, Dr.